Thank you so much, Jeanette, for that uh, very excessive introduction. Uh, we've been we've been doing things together for so many years. Uh, she, she was one of the premier booksellers in New York, and she has been one of the mainstays of the Academy of American Poets, along with Lynn Chase, who who's here tonight. And so I feel like uh, we're sort of destined to be uh, in sync on, on so many things. And it's, it's a very great uh, honor for me to, to be asked to come here. This is such a wonderful institution. And uh, in some ways, it's, uh, how would I say, a reflection, maybe, of the library where Leopardi actually learned everything he learned. His father had a great library in Reykanati, the, the small town in uh, the Marque in, in, um, near the Adriatic coast where, where he uh, was born and lived much of his life. His father was a, how would we say, slightly ne'er-do-well count who, who who squandered a lot of his fortune on his library. He had one of the great libraries of, of the day, mainly classical and, and uh, religious works. And Leopardi, who was one of his eight children, was an amazingly gifted uh, scholar, even as a boy. And he read the whole library, so that by the age of 13, he knew much more than uh, the priests who were teaching him, and, and his education stopped because uh, it went on privately. He taught himself. He learned many languages. He learned the whole of classical literature and Hebrew. He learned English, German, French, of course. And he became a, a prodigy. He was born in 1798. And so he was uh, a young teenager, really, uh, during the Napoleonic uh, adventure. And his parents were very reactionary. And uh, the, the Ray Canati was part of the Papal States. It was owned by the Pope. And, and Italy was a uh, checkerboard of uh, small principalities and uh, states that were owned by other powers at, uh, at, at that time. And Leopardi, inspired uh, in some ways by the Napoleonic moment, became interested in Italian selfhood, Italian statehood. Uh, and, and he wrote his first poems, uh, uh, his first public published poems, were exhortations to Italians to recover the glory of the of the past. Uh, his first poem in 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 the Conti, this the, uh, this book, is called Alitalia to Italy, and it's exhorting uh, Italians to recover the greatness that they inherited and which has been lying fallow and for. Uh, hundreds of years since the fall of the Roman Empire. So uh, Leopardi later on, he died in uh, uh, 1838, but uh, later on during the Risorgimento, during the movement, revolution for Italian independence, he was a hero to, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Italian patriots, but also to other liberation uh, movements in Europe in, in, the, in the 19th century. So he had a, there was a big political dimension to his, uh, his fame. He had fame as a teenager, as a classical scholar. He had fame as a, uh, a kind of political figure. But his, but we know him today for, for another aspect of his uh, work, which was that at the same time he, that he was writing these canzoni, these public odes, he was also experimenting 
with writing a kind of personal poetry that had never really been seen before. He explored his own feelings in, in very brilliant and uh, very uh, passionate and sad poems of loneliness and uh, uh, alienation that really are the basis of the kind of fame that he has in our world today, beyond the, beyond the realm of Italy, uh, where his importance is so overpowering. In, in the wider world, he's seen, I think, as the first modern European poet in many ways. And, and it's the personal part of his work that uh, resonates most deeply with us. And I'm going to concentrate tonight on reading some of those poems and talking about them a little. Now, Jeanette mentioned that I dedicated this book to Shirley, Shirley Hazard, the great writer who's also someone I had the pleasure of publishing at FSG. Shirley lived for many years, half the year here and half the year in Naples, which is where Leopardi died. And she n knew uh, everything about Leopardi. <laughs> she knows his work <laughs> inside out, by heart. And sh she took me to his tomb uh, uh, right on the outskirts of Naples, which was one of the most beautiful days I ever had. Uh, it's a, it's and Leopardi's tomb is right next to what's historic, what's mythologically called Virgil's tomb. So it's a very special, special place uh, in, in Italy. But we'll get to that later. Now I'm going to start with, by reading you Leopardi's most famous poem. It's called L'Infinito, the Infinite. He wrote this when he was 20 years old, I believe. And it's, I, well, let me read it and then we'll talk about it. And I'm going, I'm not a great uh, pronouncer of Italian, but I didn't think ahead of an inviting an Italian friend to come and read the originals. So I'm going to take the risk of reading just this one poem in Italian. I won't, I won't impose my Italian on you the rest of the night, but uh, ideally, I like to read the translations after the Italian so that you can s get a sense of how, how the, the language structures relate anyway. L'infinito. Sempre caro mi fu quest ermo colle e questa siepe che da tanta parte dell'ultimo orizzonte il guardo esclude. Ma sedendo e mirando in terminati spazi di là da quella e sovrumani silenzi e profondissima quiete io nel pensier mi fingo ove per poco il cor non si spaura. E come il vento odo stormir tra queste piante io quello infinito silenzio a questa voce vo camparando. E mi sovien l'eterno e le morte stagioni e la presente e viva, e il suon di lei. Così tra questa immensità s'anega il pensier mio, e il naufragar me dolce in questo mare. Infinity, I called my translation. This lonely hill was always dear to me, and this hedgerow, which cuts off the view of so much of the last horizon. But sitting here and gazing, I can see beyond, in my mind's eye, unending spaces and superhuman silences and depthless calm, till what I feel is almost fear. And when I hear the wind stir in these branches, I begin comparing that endless stillness with this noise, and the eternal comes to mind and the dead seasons, and the present living one, and how it sounds. So my mind sinks in this immensity, 
and foundering is sweet in such a sea. I think you see in this poem Leopardi confronting a world that is un, unknowable, un, incomprehensible, threatening, and uh, and he, there's a kind of desire for self dissolution uh, in in the poem. And as I say, he wrote this with, when he was 20. It was his first confrontation with his with his relationship to the world and it, his poetry is an existential poetry really it's about uh, it's about how how we are in the world and our solitude he uh, he he was really an epicurean he was definitely uh, a pagan he 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 was anti-christian he he grew up in a um, smotheringly Christian household, and I think that he needed to get away from it. And he, and it was really not so much in Latin literature, but in Greek literature that he found his freedom. And I, his poems are really, I think, an attempt to do Greek in in Italian, which is a, a very impossible, paradoxical thing to attempt. But. At the, he brought something new to poetry and to the Italian language in doing this. Now I'm going to read uh, a few more of the early, what they're called idols, these poems set in, in Recanati, in the country, that are really uh, uh, idyllic. And uh, uh, I'm going to read, the, ne the next one I'm going to read is a la luna, to the moon, which is the same length as l'infinito, uh, and as, as you'll see, much more lacrimose. To the moon. O oh, graceful moon, I can remember, now the year has turned, how filled with anguish I came here to this hill to gaze at you. And you were hanging then above those woods the way you do now, lighting everything. But your face was cloudy, swimming in my eyes due to the tears that filled them, for my life was torment, and it is, it doesn't change, beloved moon of mine. And yet it helps me thinking back, reliving the time of my unhappiness. Oh, in youth, when hope has a long road ahead and the way of memory is short, how sweet it is remembering what happened though it was sad, and though the pain endures. So those are his first private, what I would call his first private effusions. Uh, and now I'm going to read you uh, his, his second most famous poem, which is A Silvia. This is this is something he wrote a little later, but again, it's about it's set in Recanati and it's about loss and memory, and it's a great poem. To Sylvia. Sylvia to Sylvia. Yeah. Sylvia, do you remember still? That moment in your mortal life when beauty shimmered in your smiling, startled eyes, as bright and pensive you arrived at the threshold of youth. The quiet rooms and streets outside echoed with your endless song as you sat bending to your woman's work, happy enough with the hazy future in your head. It was fragrant May, and so you spent your day. Sometimes when I left the cherished books and the belabored pages on which my young years and the best of me were spent to listen from my father's balcony to the sound of your singing and your swift hands back and forth on the heavy loom, I looked out on the cloudless sky, the golden streets, the gardens, 
and far off the sea here and mountains there. No mortal tongue can tell all that I felt. What light thoughts, what hopes, what hearts, my Sylvia, what human life and fate were to us then. When I remember so much hope, I'm overcome, bitter, inconsolable, and rage against my own ill luck. O oh, nature, nature, why don't you deliver later what you promised then? Why do you lead on your children so? You, before winter had withered the grass, stricken, then overcome by hidden sickness, died, gentle girl. You didn't see your years come into flower, sweet talk about your raven hair or your beguiling guarded glance never melted your heart, and on holidays you never talked love over with your friends. Before long, my sweet hope died too. The fates denied me youth also. Ah, how truly past you are, dear companion of my innocence, my much lamented hope. Is this that world? Are these the joys, love, deeds, experience we spoke so often of? Is this man's fate? When the truth dawned, you fell away, poor thing, and from afar pointed out cold death and a naked grave. Leopardi was uh, a very was ill his whole life. He had scoliosis, curvature of the spine, and he was short and unprepossessing physically, and he never had love. He never, uh, there was never a woman who returned his love. And uh, so disappointed hope, the illusion of love, these are, these are uh, recurrent topics in his poetry. He claimed that it was his own philosophical studies and, and thought that, that brought him to, the, to his, these, uh, his pessimism. Uh, but others accused him of being pessimistic because he was unhappy. Uh, and uh, the, the, he, he rejected that vehemently. But in any case, uh, he was a proponent of the idea that, that life is only disappointing, that's, that it's painful and nasty, brutish, and short. And, uh, and yet, he, he also believed that the only things in life worth living for are one's illusions, that that what humans really want is happiness, and and uh, that uh, the 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 seeking of happiness is really what human life is all about. So the the the, the tension in his work between disappointment and hope is very very deep and uh, enduring. Now I want to read you. Uh, a poem called uh, The Evening of the Holiday, which Shirley used as the title of one of her early novels. And I recommend that book to you, along with her wonderful book about Naples, uh, The Bay of Noon, which is such a great love story. The Evening of the Holiday. The night is soft and bright and without wind, and the moon hangs still above the roofs and kitchen gardens, showing every mo mountain clear in the distance. Oh, my lady, every lane is quiet now and night lights glow in the windows only here and there. You sleep, for sleep came easily to you in your still room. No worry troubles you, nor can you imagine what a wound you opened in my heart. Yes, you sleep, while I come to my window to salute this sky that seems so kind, an eternal, all-commanding nature who created me for suffering. 
I deny you hope, she told me, even hope. Let your eyes never shine except with tears. This was a holiday. Tonight you rest from play, and in your sleep perhaps dream of all the men you charmed today, and those who charmed you too. But I don't come to mind, not that I hope to. So I ask myself how long I have to live and fall down on the ground and rage and shake. Horrific days at such a tender age. On the road not far from me, I hear the lonely song of the workman coming late from his evening out to his poor home. Coming late from his evening out to his poor home. And my heart is stricken to think how everything in this world passes and barely leaves a trace. Look, the holiday is gone. The workday follows, and time makes off with every human accident. Where is the clamor of those ancient peoples? Where is the renown of our famed ancestors and the great empire of their Rome, her armies, and the din she made on land and sea? Everything is peace and quiet now. The world is calm and speaks no more of them. In my young years, in the time of life, when we wait impatiently for Sunday. Afterwards, I'd lie awake unhappy, and late at night, a song heard on the road, dying note by note as it passed by, would pierce my heart the same way, even then. I'd like to read uh, a a related poem called Saturday in the Village, Il Sabato del Villaggio, that is from a second phase of, of poetic inspiration that, that Leopardi had in his early 30s. He, he wrote the first idols in his early 20s, and then he had a period where he devoted himself mainly to writing philosophical dialogues that were the operette morali, which are another great work of his. Uh, that are very radical and pessimistic and are, the, are another part of his achievement. Leopardi really wrote, I would say his main preoccupations were philosophical philo and philological. And in some ways, his poems are explications of his ideas. They're not uh, image-based effusions the way so much of our poetry is, but they are, uh, how, how shall I say, cautionary incidents or tales that have a kind of mythic, symbolic quality. They're very, uh, the description is very pared down uh, and, as and essential, and uh, it's not, uh, it's personal, but it, it's lifted to the level of myth by this stripped down uh, the quality, I think. So uh, his poems, he really, he wrote one book of 41 poems. He kept adding to it, republishing it, changing the title of it, but, but this was his book, and in this book he tried many different kinds of poetry, from the political odes, historical odes I wrote, satires, uh, contemporary criticism, a social criticism of sorts, and these pers personal poems, uh, some translations, and they're all different in style and uh, mode. There's certain things that go through them that, are, that they have in common, but he's always trying new things. He's an experimental writer, and that's very, a very modern thing about him, I think. Now we'll go back to Saturday in the Village. The young girl comes in from the country as the sun is setting, carrying her sheaf of grass, and in her hand she holds a bunch of violets and roses that, as always, she intends to use to decorate her breast and hair tomorrow on the holiday. The little old crone sits on the stairs and spins with her neighbors facing where day is dying and goes on telling stories of her good times when she adorned herself on Sundays too and danced the night away, still lithe and lithe, in her salad days with all her bow. 
Now the, now the air is darkening everywhere. The sky turns blue again and shadows fall again from hills and roofs while the new moon goes white. Now the bell announces the coming holiday and you could say the heart takes comfort at the sound. The crowd of children shouting in the little square and running everywhere make happy noises while the cobbler goes home whistling to his fr frugal meal looking forward to his day of rest. Later, when every other light around is out and every other thing is still, you hear the beating hammer and the saw of the carpenter up late in his, shutter, up late in his shuttered shop, hurrying as he works by lantern light to have his job done before dawn. This day is the most welcome of the seven, alive with hope and joy. Tomorrow time again will bring sadness and boredom and everyone will turn back to his same preoccupations. Playful boy, this time in bloom is like a day alive with happiness. Bright day, bright blue prelude to the feast day of your life. Enjoy it, child of mine. It is a gentle hour a radiant moment. I won't say more, but may your Sunday that is so slow to come not disappoint you. It's, it's all, all the pleasure is in anticipation or recollection, not in the thing itself. I'll read a, a couple more and then, we, then we'll um, we could have a little, some questions. Um, <coughs> trying to think what would be best. I'd like to read this po one. Um, this is one of his later poems uh, called On the Portrait of a Beautiful Woman. And it's, it's uh, based on a sculpture. <laughs> and actually... It's not this sculpture, but it's another sculpture by this sculptor, Pietro Tenerani, who was, who was a leading sculptor of the neoclassical movement. Uh, he was a pupil of Torvaldsen, the, Dan the great Danish sculptor who was in Rome. Uh, and uh, Leopardi went to his studio in Rome at one point, and he saw a number of his sculptures, and he was very taken with them. And he, he, um, he did another poem uh, where he pretended uh, one of these was an ancient sculpture. That's that's the one on the cover of the book. But this one is uh, based on a, a funeral monument on the portrait of a beautiful woman carved on her burial monument. She's actually a, an English countess, I believe, who died in Rome. So you were, but here, now, underground, your dust and skeleton, raised unmovable above your mud and bones to no avail, the image of your former beauty stands in silent witness as time flies, sole guardian of memory and grief. The gentle look that made men tremble when you fixed on them as you do now. The lip from which deep pleasure seemed to overflow as from a brimming urn. The neck once circled by desire. The loving hand which, when it was given, often felt the hand it took go cold. And the breast which made men visibly pale. All of these were once upon a time. Now you are mud and bones. A stone hides the indecent, miserable sight. So destiny reduces the look that seemed the brightest image of heaven among us, eternal mystery of our being. Ineff ineffable source of exalted and immense ideas and feelings, beauty reigns today and seems like splendor lavished on these sands by a divine being, a sign of reassuring hope for su superhuman destinies, for blessed realms and golden worlds for mortals. Tomorrow, for no reason, 
what was almost angelic to behold becomes repulsive to the sight, detestable, unworthy, while the admirable idea that emanated from it fades from our minds. Music's learned harmony naturally engenders endless aspirations and exalted visions in the dreaming mind, thanks to which the human spirit moves in a delicious unknown sea, almost the way a daring swimmer dives into the sea for recreation. But if a, dis but if a discordant note assails the ear, that heaven turns to nothing in an instant. Human nature, if you're merely weak and worthless, dust and shadow, why aspire so high? But if you're partly noble, why are your best actions and intentions so easily by such unworthy causes, both engendered and destroyed? You can see the abstraction of that poem. Um, and it's, it's a great poem in Italian because, this, because the beauty is in the sound. In English, it's much harder to make something, an argument like that, um, seductive. Uh, that's one of the challenges of, of doing this, this particular project because Leopardi's, the music of his language, no matter what he's saying, is, is staggering. Uh, it's a little harder for me. But I'm going to read one more poem, which is the last poem he wrote, The Setting of the Moon. And at this point, he's 38. He's living in Naples with a friend. He has cholera. He died of cholera. Maybe he doesn't have it at the time he wrote it, but he's soon to get it. And he's ill. He knows he doesn't have long to live. And it, this is a poem of farewell about, it's really a kind of uh, looking back on human life from above. Many of Leopardi's poems are uh, set in moonlight and a, a sort of contemplation of human activity in this cool half-life. Uh, and this poem is like that. It's called The Setting of the Moon. It's called The Setting of the Moon, number 33. As in the solitary night, over silvered countryside and water, where zephyr gently breathes and far-flung shadows, project a thousand lovely insubstantial images and phantoms onto still waves and branches, hedges, hills, and farms, reaching the horizon behind Apennine or Alp or on the boundless breast of the Tyrrhenian, the moon descends. The world goes colorless, shadows disappear, and one same darkness falls on hill and valley. Night is blind. And singing with a mournful melody, the carter on his way salutes the last ray of the fleeting light that led him on before. So youth fades out. So it leaves mortal life behind. The shadows and the shapes of glad illusions flee, and distant hopes that prop our mortal nature up give way. Life is forlorn, lightless. Looking ahead, the wayward traveler searches unavailingly for goal or reason on the long road he senses lies ahead and sees that man's home truly has become alien to him and he to it. Our miserable fate was judged too glad and carefree up above if youth, whose every happiness is the product of a thousand pains, should last for life. The sentence that condemns all living things to death too lenient, if first they were not given a half-life far more cruel than ter terrifying death itself. The eternal gods invented great work of immortal minds, the worst of all afflictions, old age, in which desire is unfulfilled and hope extinguished, the fonts of pleasure withered, pain ever greater, and with no more joy. You, hills and shores, the splendor past that turned the veil of night to silver in the west will not stay orphaned long. 
for in the opposite direction soon you'll see the sky turn white again and dawn arise, after which the sun, flaming with potent fire everywhere, will, bla will bathe you and the heavenly fields in floods of brilliance. But mortal life, once lovely youth has gone, is never died by other light or other dawns again. She remains a widow all the way. And the gods determined that the night that hides our other times ends in the grave. So that's a little taste of Leopardi. Thank you. Does anyone have some comments or questions or yes? Well, it took me about 10 years to do this book. And um, I, I did it after I had uh, worked on translating Montale's poetry. I worked about 13 years on that project. And when, when that was done, I, I knew I wanted to keep going with my engagement with Italian. But I, d I, I thought I'd go backwards, not forwards in terms of time. And, and uh, Fairly soon I decided that to try Leopardi because I didn't think very much of most of the translations I've, I'd seen. But I had no idea how hard it was going to be because he really is a poet who's so... His, the, as I tried to say earlier, the, the beauty of his expression is, is so... Uh, so is, is because of his perfect command of his, of his instrument, meaning the Italian language. And, and so things that are very, very um, nakedly, uh, merely ideas, with, with not clothed in metaphor, really, he's not really a very metaphorical poet, are, are, are that's really the substance of, of much of his poetry. And and to, to turn that kind of argument into something that is poetic as we understand it is very, very hard for me, uh, for, I think, for most people. And so that, and also a lot of Leopardi's poetry, these poems are, are written in this more personal, quiet voice, uh, inner voice. But there's all, there are other poems that are written in a kind of rhetorical language that reaches back into the 17th century and uh, or to Petrarch even and uh, it's hard to make those into something that someone today would want to read in our language and so that was another challenge so it was very very demanding and also to learn his his world and uh, what his reading and all is uh, was a very big challenge. We're all, we're actually publishing another book of Leopardi's in two, uh, not this coming year, the year after, which is his huge notebook that he kept called the Zibaldone. Uh, it's about a 2,500 page book, and uh, uh, six translators have have devoted themselves to this project and. Uh, it's it's going to be a revelation. It's one of the great books of the 19th century, but it's never been fully translated in, in English before. So how did it change my life? Well, I think that... It, I think his pessimism probably hung over me so that, <laughs> so that when I uh, finished with it, I felt a certain lift. Uh, I think that I learned a lot about writing. I think... Some of my own poems have been influenced by things I was doing, uh, trying to do here e without even knowing necessarily. Um, and I think I, I called my uh, Montale book my, my PhD because, uh, yeah, you know, it took 13 years and I learned a lot doing it. And I, so this is my second PhD. <laughs> Roger.
Well, he was first translated by Macaulay. Uh, not, not Macaulay. Is it Macaulay? It, it, was, it was an English politician. Um, not Macaulay. Um, a, a great, uh, uh, who was very interested in his political ideas. And then uh, James Thompson, who wrote The City of Dreadful Night, was a great Leopardian, and, he, and that was uh, in the Victorian area. And he th thought of himself as sort of the English Leopardi, though he's, he's rather purple by comparison. Uh, but he w so he was known really more for his public stance in the, in the, in the mid-19th century. Uh, Matthew Arnold was certainly uh, interested in Leopardi. And um, I think that there are a lot of affinities between Leopardi and the Romantic poets, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge especially. Uh, I don't think they knew his work, but uh, he may have known theirs to, to a certain degree. He certainly knew J James Thompson, the um, wrote author of The Seasons. Uh, but uh, he... He really, you know, he was really a, what he was reading were Enlightenment writers. That, and he loved Madame de Stael. She was very important to him. Uh, but uh, he, he, most of his education was in the, classic, uh, the classical world or in the Enlightenment. So I don't know if that's an answer to your question. But any, yes, sir. Um, I'm sure they have, but I don't, uh, I can't tell you of any, um, but there have been movies uh, based on his poems and uh, novels that were inspired by them in different ways. Uh, but I'm sure there is, there is music, uh, but I don't know who, who the composers are. Yes, sir. Well, I don't know much about that, but I do know that I read, I used uh, a very good French translation. That was, I mean, I mean, that was one of the books I consulted most carefully when I was doing my own translation to, to try to see if I was understanding it. This man named uh, Philippe Orcel uh, did a very, very good translation and, and very beautifully annotated too. Uh, some of his some of the poems he translated in, in prose, actually, some of the more argumentative ones. I decided against that, but uh, uh, I thought it was a very impressive piece of work. I think that Nietzsche loved Leopardi. Uh, I, I, I don't know about translations into German of Leopardi because I don't read German. But that's a really interesting. I, I would think that th that he would come across well in German. Yeah. Yes, Lance. Everybody <coughs> remembers the uh, the argument that uh, Nabokov and Edmund Wilson had about translating Pushkin, where Nabokov said that they should be just absolutely literal because you couldn't get the music. Did you find yourself facing that problem? I mean, or how did you how did you deal with that? Problem? Well, I really try in doing translation to be literally accurate. Uh, so the accuracy was paramount? Uh, I, I try to be literally accurate to make it sound like good English, and then, if I can, to do something more uh, in terms of beauty. or But, but I think that uh, accurate... But I didn't. I don't agree with um, Nabokov's view on it because Nabokov wanted to annotate every nuance of 
of Russia and etc. And he, he wanted to produce a trot, really. That's what he thought a translation should be. And I, I don't agree with him. I think we have to try to make it into a beautiful thing in our own language. And, and for instance, certain registers of idiom that, that um, he uses a lot of archaic words in, in uh, uh, his, we can't, I can't do that. If I, if I did that, I would create a pastiche that was really uh, not a piece of English language. I think the challenge in doing a translation is to make a readable version of something that br brings it up to date in a certain way. So uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I do believe in accuracy, but I also believe that the most important thing is to write something that's a good, good English sentence that's as accurate as possible. Does that make any sense? Any other? Jeanette. Well, I don't know that I was that interested in poetry as a little boy. I remember my father always read The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere on my, <laughs> <laughs> on my brother's birthday because my brother was born on April 18th. <laughs> but uh, I think when I went to uh, away to school, that's when I got interested in poetry. And um, I remember James Agee had gone to my school and he, ha I read his poetry, which was not his greatest production, but uh, I was very taken with that. And then I got interested in romantic poetry. And we read T.S. Eliot, and et cetera, et cetera. But, so it was really something that I fell in love with in adolescence, I think. And I think that's true of many people. I was very religious as an adolescent, too. But I kept my love of poetry, and I didn't <laughs> stay with it. <laughs> so, so. Thank you all very much.